welcome to the Geopolitics and Economics of the New World Order panel. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much to Marco, Marco Kangroga for saving us. Um, we had a COVID dropout on Friday and Marco uh, agreed to join us at short notice. So thank you, Marco. So here we are to talk about geopolitics, which is a topic that is front and center for many at the moment. Um, in my opinion, um, February the 24th was a day in which the world changed, um, both in general and for myself. Um, Russia invaded Ukraine, and I had a little boy. <laughs> um, but I believe that February the 24th, the day Russia invaded Ukraine, was the first properly geopolitical changing event since the fall of the Soviet Union and was the end of a period of hiatus in between. Um, and it moved markets immediately. And I'm not sure that markets were fully prepared for um, geopolitics to be back. Um, and there are new techniques now than there were in 1991. And there are new ways that, that markets can be prepared. So here we are today to explore some of those new techniques and also some of the established techniques as well. Um, in order that, as, as the geopolitical world that we have entered pr proceeds, that we are well armed and hopefully these techniques will continue to improve as well as we go along. Um, so let's start with the in introductions. Um, myself, first of all, uh, I am a former Stratfor geopolitical analyst um, and in my most recent guise, I am the host of the Alternative Data podcast and also I work for the alternative data platform Exabel. So hopefully I combine the two worlds somewhat. Um, let me pass it over to Marco. Thanks, Mark. Um, my name is Marco Kangerga. I'm the head of data science innovation at Ravenpack, a um, firm that specializes in NLP textual analytics on a scalable, sca uh, scalable uh, platform. Um, been with the firm for three and a half years, and prior to that I was at a, on the buy side at a discretionary uh, event-driven fund in New York. And um, currently I'm kind of uh, trying to bridge the gap between purely systematic quantitative solutions and um, uh, fundamentally driven themes. Hi, um, I'm Natalia Bigayova. Um, I'm a national security analyst. I've been doing open source intelligence analysis of Russia's military and information operations for the last several years, uh, from Africa to the former Soviet Union. Um, my interest has grown increasingly in technologies that automate open source intelligence, and this is how I learned and joined the company called Vertical Knowledge. We're a global uh, collection platform for publicly available data. I'm Ben Emmons. I work for Medley Global Advisors. We're a macroeconomic policy research firm and consultancy firm. We focus on the word policy, Fed policy, ECB, other central banks. Uh, prior, I was a portfolio manager on the buy side. I worked at firms like PIMCO, Naveen. Started my career in investment banking, more on derivatives trading. So, been about 26 years in financial markets, uh, and always been a strategist at trading role. Yeah. Uh, my name is Peter Marber. I head up emerging market investing at Aperture Investors. I am a career dedicated emerging market manager. I've been in these markets now for around 30 years. Um, seen a lot of changes, and I'm a consumer of a lot of uh, alternative data. Fantastic, thank you all. So let's begin. I've already kind of touched on the Russia-Ukraine situation, but this is somewhat front and center in, in at least through the geopolitical lens at the moment. Um, we're lucky enough to have Natalia, who is also, um, as well as working for Vertical Knowledge, as she mentioned, she is also a Russia Fellow at the Institute for the Study of Wars, so perfectly positioned. How does Vertical Knowledge help its clients understand Russia-Ukraine today, um, both in terms of the battlefield, but also in terms of the kind of the secondary aspects which, which are coming out of the battlefield? Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying that Russia's war in Ukraine is the definition of a complex problem to try to understand and watch, given myriad of micro events that are happening on the ground every day, but also given multiple dimensions that um, shape this conflict, be it the military situation and the fact it's a war in Europe with the use of land, sea, air, uh, cyber domains, or economic dimension of it uh, with Russia blocking grain in the ports or Russia's dependence on, let's say, Western microelectronics for its advanced weapon systems, 
or the whole another level uh, that adds complexity, which is the information domain, uh, with Russia trying to shape perceptions of decision making um, and policymakers around the world, including people in this room, um, which makes it very hard to parse through uh, data that's coming out um, in this war. So, and the problem is, of course, it's complexity that cannot be reduced. It must be understood in full if anyone uh, wants to have insight that's actually relevant for decision making. So, when um, we think about vertical knowledge, uh, we help automate collections. In specific case of Russia's war against Ukraine, um, it allows me, for example, to uh, collect data from multiple sources, multiple languages across the world in near real time and look at this complex problem set from multiple angles. But if we zoom out uh, and think about you know, the analytical supply chain from collection to processing to analysis to synthesis, uh, vertical knowledge is specifically focused on collections and getting hard to get data for financial customers or public sector customers, either as a snapshot in time or persistently um, either as a, a discovery of new sources or um, even just comprehensively from a specific source. Uh, final thing I'll mention, you know, there are many unique things about this war, but as we look ahead, I think crises will have increasing convergence of uh, security, tech, markets element, and um, everyone who either makes decisions or needs to inform decision will increasingly become an open source researcher, whether they realize it yet or not. Thank you very much. When you came on the podcast, then I likened vertical knowledge to being something like an industrial strength hoover that could be pointed by clients at whatever they wanted to, to gather data on. Um, so in this case, this is um, the, the, uh, the geopolitical um, solutions are very clear. So then we have Ravenpack, which is, it's, it's both providing the data, but also adding a layer of, of computational prowess on top of it. Um, how, Marco, perhaps you could actually introduce Ravenpack's product a little bit, but also then talk about how, um, in real use cases, how it might be useful for a, for a client trying to understand the situations. Sure, so Ravenpack basically uh, structures text into machine-readable format at a millisecond latency. And uh, does that across 40,000 sources, 13 languages, and 12 million entities that are you know, detected in point in time. So that allows users to curate any sort of theme that they want to analyze over time, for example, because every single one of the events that we capture is time-stamped. So in the context of, say, geopolitics, um, fun exercise we did, for example, when it uh, came to um, the invasion was track military activity in local languages, um, segmented by the type of event, whether it's bombing or military presence or anything of that sort, and map it onto the places that we were detecting within that context. So we could sort of see that invasion progress over time and that it's not specifically a constraint to Donbas region, that it's uh, moving past that as well. Um, another one, for example, is uh, kind of the, in the actionable intelligence segment um, is tracking various themes relating to pandemics, in this case, uh, COVID, um, and tracking a panic index, for example, uh, using a set of curated um, um, entity mentions, as we call them, within a region, within a language, by source. And we could track, um, for example, anti-vax sentiment between regions, uh, within micro regions, um, or any sort of disruption that's coming up as a result of that. So sort of like co analytics. And then we can point in time, see how this has trended over time. And that's more of the kind of an actionable analytics. On the other side, you have predictive analytics, which we can talk about a little bit more, but uh, it's a, a similar exercise of look, uh, looking at curated themes, how they've changed over time, and what that means for a particular first, second order derivative. Um, impact. My old boss back in my geopolitics days used to say that the issue, the greatest intelligence failure of uh, history um, was the failure of the CIA to predict the fall of the Soviet Union, given the amount of money which had been 
um, put towards understanding and trying to understand what's going on over there. And the, and the issue was that all that money had been focused towards the, the, the generals at the top rather than, and the fall of the Soviet Union happened not with the, with the generals at the top's knowledge. It was, the, it, was the, it was on the ground, it was a situation on the ground and they were just looking in the wrong direction. Um, I feel like a lot of these quantitative solutions that, that, you've, that you've both laid out are the kinds of ways that you can be looking more at the situation on the ground rather than just looking at the leaders, which is perhaps a, a historic way. Um, but let's move on to, so Ben of Medley Advisors, you have uh, very much a, a more kind of inf, uh, inflation, interest rate, central bank kind of focus, focus on the world, lens on the world. Um, what kind of data do you look at in order to track um, the, the results of, of geopolitical uh, conflicts and, and, and activities? So on the one hand, it's actually conventional data. Right? It's just simply what's published. Um, and it's obviously run through all kinds of model uh, projections. What we do with that is that with Medley Advisors, we have access to Federal Reserve, ECB, and other officials. We have access to staffers. So we've got a lot of access to, to, let's say, econometrics and models that are, you know, not something you could just generally run on a spreadsheet or a Bloomberg or something like that. So um, we use that as, our, as an input. If I listen to their um, data sources, that would be actually of interest to ourselves too. But what I would say for us is really key is that we, we're sourcing based. And so we have, like say in Ukraine and Russia, we have people on the ground that we talk to officials or related people um, that's not just at the central bank, but it's also in government or other agencies. So in a way, we're you know gathering intelligence. That would be probably one of our key data as input to our thinking of providing insight to our clients what could happen here. So as we go through this conflict now, as you open the the, uh, the discussion, it's the most significant event not just this year, but it's a paradigm shift as the other panel discussed. It has this huge effect on inflation. So our job now is, is that the reaction by central banks is what we're obviously analyzing and try to give our investors a better understanding with the input of the sourcing data, with conventional data that interacts at the central bank's models and try to figure out like, these are the steps they're going to take. Now it may look, look like very transparent at the moment, it's very clear the Federal Reserve will keep hiking, even if the economy slows, even getting a recession, or we're in a recession, which some people claim we are, uh, but it's also a function of like, what is not only the appropriate amount of tightening and how do they think about it, ultimately it comes down to the turn, the change in, in that tightening path. Yeah, that's what people want to know, so. Fantastic. Um, and Peter, you have been in this world for a long time. You're an emerging markets investor and you've written several books, um, including ones about globalization and, and, um, and big data. Um, how, and you've also, I know, have, have a relationship with a company called GeoQuant, which is a provider of data, of um, quantitative data around, around geopolitical risk. So you've, you've kind of seen this world from, um, uh, from the inside for, for, a, for a long period. How would you contextualize the, the changing approaches to geopolitical analysis, that kind of qualitative, quantitative, how, how is it all, how would, you, how would you see the picture? Well, it's clear that uh, you can use the introduction of the internet as a kind of a timeline, a divider. There's the pre-internet world, um, and then there's the post-internet world. And interestingly, I had a, a good chunk of my career, it was a few years before the internet really came out. And in terms of geopolitics, it wasn't really that easy to keep abreast of things. And, uh, you know, for example, if there was a, a coup d'etat or an assassination in sub-Saharan Africa on a Friday, there's a pretty good chance I wouldn't know about it unless I, you know, scroll to the 57th page of the New York Times on Sunday. And then, of course, I'd have to figure out, well, where is Burkina Faso, right? You know, you would have a much different discovery process for, for, for at least even gathering that information. Um, and so at that time, if you were a global investor, and I was fortunate to be at a big Swiss bank, uh, we had offices in a lot of these countries. And so you could call your man in Havana, or woman, whoever it was. Like we had offices in Latin America in 20 countries, you know, uh, a handful of African countries, all throughout Asia and parts of uh, Eastern Europe, not necessarily the former Soviet Union, but 
you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, in uh, Yugoslavia at the time. Places like that. Um, and that network that Bill's talking about um, of central banker, ex-central bankers, ex-CIA, ex-foreign service, most good investors would have their true Rolodex, I mean, I'm talking about a physical paper Rolodex with little business cards of your people to call to get that kind of on the ground, you know, sense of what's happening. And I, I, I think about the, con the political risk consulting firms that started back then. The one that comes to mind is uh, Henry Kissinger's firm. You know, Kissinger Associates, where you would call them up. And of course, he had this great Rolodex. And if you wanted to know what was going on in West Africa or what was going on in the Baltics, you know, you could actually, you know, get some interesting insight. And I, I've, I don't mean it pejoratively, but I think those types of people would provide a kind of a chat therapy. Um, because if you were in an information vacuum, you needed people to chat you through like what the risks were. And, and chat therapy is actually useful because it could just sort of calm you down. You could make more reasonable decisions. Um, but, but then, of course, internet kicks in and then we start having lots of data coming out. And, um, and then it becomes very clear that, that there's other ways for you to keep tabs on what's happening. And uh, I think it became very, very clear to me during the Brazil um, Lavagato uh, uh, car wash scandal, uh, in which suddenly we had a scandal at the presidential level, and there were a lot of people in Brazil the, who were going on to Google, doing a search in Portuguese for the phrase, what does it take to become impeached as a president in Brazil? And so you were starting to get Google trend data that, that, that you could now look at as some kind of uh, piece of information on your data dashboard. Um, and in fact, that might be more valuable than your man in Sao Paulo or Rio who was gonna tell you what was happening. Like, this was a, getting a much better barometer. And uh, I would say that that's what's happened maybe in the last uh, eight to 10 years. And certainly um, uh, I would say, think of Medley as one of those early chat therapy types. But of course now they have to integrate data into their process. And then you've got uh, these other two fel folks who also are looking at data every day and trying to um, analyze it. And I thought, Natalia, you made a good point, which is, how does somebody like me, an asset manager in New York or London or wherever you're based, um, keep tabs on 80 countries? I don't speak 30 or 40 foreign languages. I can't read every newspaper in all of these countries every day. I can't, certainly can't web scrape all of the social media from these countries. And we know that that information absolutely moves markets these days. So I think that if you are a global investor, you've had to really evolve a way uh, from 100% reliance on your man in Havana to a kind of a combination, a, a, a kind of a, a, a centaur model where you've got some human interpretation but a lot of uh, uh, data that's being generated um, in much more real time. I think, um, I think the markets, as I mentioned earlier, I think the markets haven't aren't used to necessarily think about thinking about geopolitical problems in the way that they think about you know interest rates and inflation etc um, and so I think there's an awful lot of kind of dormant capability in this in this space and there's a lot of thinking that could be done of tools that have been created potentially for and and to be brought to bear on on geopolitical questions I was spitballing with someone in alternative data last week and we were saying you know if you could, um, if if you could use some kind, if you could use um, knowledge graphs, which which relate every word to to every other word, essentially in, in in the internet, for example, then you could see the 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 knock-on effects of if Russia invaded Ukraine, then which words lead to which words, which lead to which words. So you know, nickel's going to come up quite quickly, for example, and you know that as a result, you know, uh, nickel would be would be something to watch out for. Um, so there's various technologies which, which, uh, and and we have here two two guests who already ha are using the technologies. But I, but it's 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 a it's a space which could definitely um, could 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 grow more for sure as as it becomes more of a, a front and center issue. Um, 
so moving a stepping away a little bit from from Russia Ukraine and looking ahead um, and and kind of given that taking for given that that geopolitics is back it was already kind of back we had we had a US China trade war we've we've had various tra- tensions great power competition we are in a we already we were entering a new paradigm already um, given that Natalia um, looking ahead what do you see as being the broader implications of this war for the international order um, and if there was a crisis how would you how would you watch it play out um, yeah I'll, I'll answer those separately so I think there are this war is, is a global level event that pushed us onto a different historical trajectory. And the, we're not going back to, to the previous baseline here. I think we're still in the phase where decisions of actors on each side are shaping the situation on the ground, so outcome is not yet determined. But it is clear um, to everyone who's watching it closely that there are no short-term off ramps given how Russia framed this war as essentially a choice uh, for Ukraine of either existence or obliteration as a, uh, as a statehood. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things that emerge for, from that that would have implications, I think, for markets, but also for the broader uh, geopolitical order. So first, um, it's actually a major effect, I think, on some of the supply chains. And one example that I think of uh, often is the fact that pretty much all Soviet equipment, military equipment, is being destroyed right now on the battlefield in Ukraine by one side or the other. Um, There will be a vacuum and a gap that will be filled by other uh, providers. Uh, Or as we think about countries that depend on Russia, for the provision of technology or weapon systems, um, Russia won't have much um, to offer soon in that space, given where we are in this war. I think another implication is actually the role of Russia. We're still, I think, far from a definite outcome of the war, but a couple of things are clear. You know, before February 24th, um, Putin and, and the Kremlin had several concrete niche but still limited sources of power and global leverage, um, including nukes, including a seat in the UN Security Council, you know, energy, uh, niche military capabilities. But in fact, you know, Russia has been masquerading as a great power for quite some time, and a lot of that veil and that projection uh, is being, being, you know, destroyed now because everyone sees the true capability, including Russia's neighbors in the former Soviet states, that are actually not uh, behaving as the Kremlin expected them, including countries like Kazakhstan or even Belarus, where Russia has a lot of control. Uh, so I think we'll see uh, reshaping of the role of Russia, given that is both leverage and value proposition to either its partners or even people inside of Russia will decrease regardless of the outcome immediately on the battlefield. Um, I would also say, finally, you know, going back to your question, how would one watch such crisis? Um, I think we're in an interesting time where um, you know, intelligence analysis or geopolitical analysis used to be very uh, manual and you would you know, read things and you would watch them uh, and you would try to parse insight. But a lot of this now can be automated. And when I think about source, um, sources, right, these are usually sources in the sense that they produce information. They can be physically present on the ground or they can share that information through other medium, be it social media platform or or anything else. And ability to um, capture that data at scale and also parse through it in the most efficient way. It's kind of how do you get through the universe of data in the shortest possible path? Uh, I think it's gonna be the core question that will kind of drive how technology evolves, but also how method for watching crisis evolve, because it will have three core components. One is technology, one is new types of teams. You know, you, cannot, you can no longer have uh, a bucket for a national security analysts and a bucket for financial, you know, you have to have people who understand all three intact. Um, you have to have platform and you have to have evolving methods that I think are transforming now at a very rapid scale. So it's an exciting time, I think, to be um, thinking about this problem set. At the, at the risk of taking it back to Russia, Ukraine, but it is, it is front and center at the moment. 
it strikes me just watching this conflict play out that there is so many new open source forms of information which are now flowing, be it the Ukrainian with a, with a mobile phone taking photos of a tank going past his front window or the satellite data which is made available. It's, it's the firm's data, I think it's called, isn't it? And, and the analysis of that. Just, there's many more forms of data which are now coming into the, into the, um, into the, into the brain of, of, of a, a place like the Institute for the Study of War. Um, so it's, a, it's a new opportunities, it strikes me. It's a, it's a bit of a curveball, but do you see um, there being more, do you see, no, I won't, I won't ask a curveball, don't worry, okay, I'll move on. Um, so, Marco, how, coming back to the, to the big picture and, and the kind of the new geopolitical paradigm, potentially, how do you think Ravenpack might be able to help its, help its clients to analyze things that are coming down the line of a geopolitical nature? Right, so we, we already talked about sort of actionable intelligence, what is happening in the moment. It's a relatively obvious use case where you can kind of track over time and it's important because, uh, you know, the old adage, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So kind of seeing how certain events historically played out might help you uh, discern what, what situation you're in and what's going to happen. Um, it traditionally in quant frameworks, you kind of need a solid amount of history in order to backtest the strategy, et cetera. But in the discretionary fundamental spa space, you um, really need some sort of an insight to drive your decisions forward. Um, so for example, in the case of, uh, let's say, uh, ESG and climate change, you might look at the incidence of, say, floods across all regions in the world from um, you know, 40,000 sources that I mentioned previously, and you can identify blips where the incidence of such events is increasing. And all of a sudden you uh, have regions that should uh, provide red flags in terms of both you know, the kind of human uh, element and both from an economic standpoint if you are, say, um, um, an investor in, the, in that particular region. And uh, separately, we, b we built a, a model to monitor and predict the winner of uh, any election uh, by monitoring uh, the bifurcation and the uh, uh, information coming out of local news sources and social media. Um, and it's all on a scalable sort of, uh, in a sort of scalable way because of the sea of data that's coming our way and uh, transformed into machine readable format. So there are multiple ways to curate the data in order to at least bubble up bottoms up the themes that may inform your views in the world and uh, help you make bit better decisions. It's a, it really comes down to curation of the highly granular data that uh, comes out of our system. Fantastic. And then obviously with every, with every action, there's a reaction in a way. When you've, when you've got the flood data, then you then get a feeling for where the displaced peoples might be potentially. And then you can start tracking perhaps immigration and we might get a migration wave of some sort and, and et cetera. So it's kind of, it's, it's building the, the links on, onwards as well using, using data. Correct, and that's, the, that's a difficulty with, with black swan events. They're black swan for a reason, and uh, kind of having the ability to quickly um, home in on the theme and how you think it might be evolving in the near term is a huge advantage. Absolutely. Um, so, Ben, we are uh, in a inflationary environment nowadays, as everybody knows, um, and central banks are, are acting accordingly. Where will you be looking for clues? Um, where, where, will we, where will you be looking for clues as to the future of inflation? Uh, that's actually a really complex question now, right? Because um, if, if you think of Ukraine, I think maybe to your point, too, people had not a really good understanding of the strategic position that Ukraine has in the global food supply chain, if you call it that way. I mean, I. I Prior to the conflict, I think many of our clients, investors, had not focused much on how much is produced and food oils as an example, which is a, you would think, never think of that, but it reverberates now through the, through the supply chain and is really driving up inflation everywhere as, as one example. Uh, but there are obviously the reactions, you say, to this conflict has happened. Right? One, there's an embargo on Russian oil that is now leading to cutting off gas, which is because of the default in ruble payments from that contract. 
Of course, that's what Germany and Europe wants to get to, but it's not that simple. And now you're going to get skyrocketing coal prices in Europe. The producer price index from Germany was at a record high yesterday. What is showing in there? Rising electricity, heat, water, and energy, right? So it continues to really percolate. As much as there's the theory in the markets out there, like this is going to peak, inflation is going to roll off, all the statistical analysis on it, that's actually out of the window if you look at this data carefully. And again, back to the reaction of like, we didn't understand exactly this position, now we do. But now the, the complication is that Ukraine actually has a lot of still production of grain and, and so forth. It's actually not completely halted. It's all sitting there. How is it going to get out? Nobody really knows. Nobody knows how the negotiation will actually play out. We're trying to get an answer on that. It's really difficult. So we're looking at an inflation picture that is really, really quickly shifted to something that people may compare to the 70s. But there's other dynamics in the 70s, I think, played a role. But there's some timing issues between ultra loose monetary policy and ultra loose fiscal policy right at this moment that this Ukraine conflict hit. And so the, the timing issue is now truly playing out in the markets of like, as the previous panel was discussing, there's kind of a dilemma. The, the, the Fed cannot really stop tightening until the inflation is under control, but it causes a recession, and therefore they, they're actually hamstrung by taking action in the future because uh, inflation is still too high, right? So we're, we're, we really moved away. So I think you're dealing with heightened inflation expectations that may indeed shift even higher. I think the alarm last week from the Michigan survey was a true alarm. Right? It was actually a bit of a watershed moment that that not happened that way, that shift. The Fed models are, are now flashing a, a more structural shift in expectations. And this is the new dynamic of inflation. And that's, I think, not in, in, in people's mindset in the markets today that are currently, let's say, their last 10 years in the markets, which a lot of people are, even 26-year-old veteran here, now, I haven't exactly seen it that way. So I think it's, it's a difficult picture to, to, um, to figure out. So you could say, yes, inflation will decline. The dollar will press down commodity prices. Credit contraction everywhere. And every economy recession will bring inflation down. Not entirely. So I think that what Larry Summers was out just now, he, dubbed the coin, he coined the phrase secular, secular stagnation about 10 years ago. He's now out with secular stagflation. Mm -hmm. He may have a real point this time. At that time, nobody listened to him. Now they do. I think he may have one. I, l I listen to him, <laughs> but the um, I mean, you make the point that uh, that Russia Ukraine is a is a factor in the inflation picture we're seeing. But but a key aspect is that it's the part that the Fed has no control over, doesn't right. it? You know, the domestic economy, the Fed can do something about, but the Russia Ukraine, the the foreign situation is 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 um, yeah out of the hands. Um, Peter, you, as I mentioned, have written books about globalization um, in in happier times for it. <laughs> um, are we, what do you think now? Are we experiencing deglobalization? Has it reversed? Are you still, um, are, you, are you fully on that train? Um, and if you agree, or, or either way, what's the best way to invest in, in this world that we're facing? Um, well, first, the question about, you know, is globalization ending? I said, I, I'm not one of these who thinks things are coming to an abrupt end, but certainly it's gonna shift and change. And, and if you think about it, the nature of the global economy and financial markets in, let's say, the last, 35 years has really shifted. You know, back in the late 80s, it was the communist versus the capitalist, and the world really was truly divided, and there really wasn't much of a global economy to speak of. I mean, you had some trade between, you know, Canada, the US, and Western Europe, and maybe Japan, and a little bit Australia, New Zealand, but essentially the world was really a cluster of domestic economies. Uh, and then we have these three big mega trends that kind of change the game. We have the uh, end of geopolitical uh, uh, wars, um, ideological wars, um, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, the market uh, orientation of communist China, and suddenly everybody's now a capitalist and, and is gonna participate. So, so the end of, of that geopolitical tension um, uh, is one of those megatrends. And the second is uh, disinflation, the fact that inflation basically coming down from the 70s and 80s to levels never really seen before. Um, and the third is the rise, the dramatic rise of the Chinese economy. So if you take those three things together, and of course they're somewhat interconnected, um, the fact that we have uh, uh, the globalization of the economy based on all countries 
uh, getting into the global system one way or another. So suddenly we can reduce the inflation that we saw in goods because we now have lots of producers and scale and more workers than we've ever had before. So, so we could keep a lid on labor costs, we can keep a lid on goods cost. Um, so that, that led to this sort of generation of inflation basically falling. And of course it all ties into China's rise because you're talking about a country that had roughly 20% of the world's population, but I don't know, maybe they were only contributing two, three, four percent of global GDP, you know, in the mid 80s. And so, you know, here we are now that they're probably very close to their, their population contribution to the world is their chunk of the global economic pie, right? Around, probably around 20%. Um, and the question is, will those trends continue? And I think if anybody's been paying attention to the markets for the last year or so, the answer is, Absolutely not, right? We have interest rates have been backing up. We have uh, geopolitical tensions that we really hadn't seen for a long time. And China's economy is, is getting to that middle income state of just kind of like, it's gonna keep growing, but certainly not anything close to the pace that we've seen before. So if there's any investor out here who hasn't like adjusted their portfolio in the last 12 months or even the last 12 weeks, um, now's not a bad time to think about it because the rules of the game are changing. The nature of the global economy is changing. And you know, you asked me whether I thought globalization was going to end. And I was like, no, but it could actually regionalize. And there are pockets of, uh, of the world that maybe we don't trade with anymore. We've got sanctions kicking in, which really could um, be meaningful. I mean, we talk about the Russian sanctions. But remember, Trump put big sanctions out on China way before the Russians uh, invaded Ukraine. So we're gonna have this new world where we're gonna have to figure out like how is the global economy reconfiguring? You know, is there gonna be an autocratic trade bloc, you know, who, who may be sanctioned out of the West and so they're gonna concentrate among themselves? It wouldn't, wouldn't be surprising. There have been regional trade patterns as long as we've had trade really if you go back throughout history. So it wouldn't surprise me if you know, the West retreated a little bit from Asia and, 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 and other parts of the world and focused a little bit maybe more on you know, US Europe and that kind of thing. And maybe the US decides to be a little less reliant on Asia uh, and, and tries to cultivate more relationships in Latin America. Certainly the supply chain issues, that the bottlenecks that have come up during COVID have kind of accelerated those trends you know, uh, towards regionalization. Um, and I think that's, that's what we all have to plan for. Do you think at some point, um, what if, uh, as we watch what you're describing happen and the, a kind of bifurcation, do you think at some point a US investor starts need to be very careful about putting their money in China for fear that something might happen to it? Do you know, what, how far are we from that and, and what would you be looking for to, to recognize the moment? Uh, it, it's interesting. It's, it is a question of, 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 you know, if you're a financial investor versus a strategic, you know, corporate investor. I think corporate investors are already worried that maybe all that investment that they put into factories and joint ventures may actually never, never pay out. You know, um, I'm not saying that those are all, are all going to be zero investments, but they just might not be nearly as profitable as they had planned 25 years ago. You know, when they built all these uh, facilities and joint ventures in the country. I think financial investors have already taken the hint. Um, there's been an enormous amount of unwinding, um, particularly in the equity markets, uh, particularly in a lot of the ADR and GDRs that don't trade locally, but, but are of local companies. I mean, we've seen a lot of Chinese delistings. So there's this kind of voluntary you know, sort of retreat that investors have been making. And I think also it's fair to say and be interested in what Ben and, and the other panelists think, is that I think China is also preparing for something of a decoupling or they have to prepare for the fact that they could eventually be a sanctioned country, whether it's because of human rights or whether because they're, they're doing business with, with people that the West says you're, you're not supposed to do business with. I think that that, that sanctions against Russia and the the kicking them out of the SWIFT system is truly the alarm bells that we are in a different kind of world as global investors um, and that you need to 
to factor that into your investment strategies. Yeah. I mean, the biggest, the biggest losers in Russia are Western uh, investors who have found some of their assets are completely frozen and untradeable, mm -hmm. right? And you just have to sit there and wait because sanctions say you can't trade them. Uh, U U.S. mutual funds are really a victim now of this, this sanction policy, but so do retirees in the United States now that have invested in these mutual funds. So this is, as you're saying, is the, this financial decoupling is really complex, but really yeah, reality is really, I think to your point, like so the trade war from 2018-19 was the first start of that decoupling. Uh, MSCI is changing the rules, so, so, the, so it's all these, these, these changes are happening. Uh, you, I think you can, can imagine that the entire ADR complex in the United States will be completely delisted at some point and move back to Hong Kong, most of those companies, relist there, so that's, that the entire investment is gone. And this, that, that is a almost close to $2 trillion of, of investing. Now, that's fortunately not too much exposure for U.S. investors, but a lot of foreigners are involved. So I think it's just a function here like... Our markets will continue to be major demand as a result. I do think that's one other aspect of it, that the dollar markets are getting more capital inflow because of the two markets you described, Russia and, and China, are completely cut off. Mm -hmm. uh, SWIFT, by the way, I don't think will be for China ever be completely cut off. That would be a cataclysmic decision to do that uh, because of the link to the true nuclear weapon. Yeah, that would be true nuclear weapon. <laughs> that's been threatened during the trade war, but it's not going to happen. The, the true nuclear weapons still yeah. exist, I have to remind you. Um, but, uh, Natalia, I, I, I feel I would be remiss to have you here to talk about geopolitics for this, for this amount of time without um, asking you just for where do you think we are in the, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Where do you see us? Um, what should we be looking for in terms of next steps? Yeah, I think um, it's important to say that Ukraine has defeated Russia's initial objectives in this war. Um, and force Russia to scale down its operational aims. Um, Russia was forced to expel, uh, withdraw its forces from Kiev direction. Ukraine has then won a battle of uh, Kharkiv uh, in northeastern Ukraine. Um, and Russia you know, then scaled down its aims to just focus on taking remaining sections of eastern Ukraine, specifically Donetsk and Luhansk region. Uh, we are in the moment where Russia is concentrated its forces to take specifically the town of uh, Syrodonetsk in, in eastern Ukraine. And one of the reasons, you know, there are uh, inflicting major losses uh, on Ukrainians right now is because it is one of the first times since February where Russia actually was able to concentrate um, its force. I think we are in the moment, um, in a pivotal moment a bit because... Uh, it's a moment where you know, Ukraine is uh, running out on one side of some of the Soviet equipment. It hasn't fully transitioned yet to Western equipment, so that dynamic really matters. At the same time, you know, Russia has very major limitations on the manpower, and it pulled uh, manpower from every possible direction it could, and there's very little Russia can do in the short term. Um, to bring um, additional man combat capable manpower to, to the battlefield that, to make uh, any significant um, breakthrough forward, I don't think it's likely. So there, uh, as we watch, I think it's, uh, instead of trying to make forecasts of specific scenarios, instead I think it's more helpful to look at like five or six dynamics that shape the system and determine which direction it moves. Um, you know, I think the first one is the speed and scale of Western aid deliveries and tracking that, uh, whether it actually matches the requirements of Ukrainian both defense uh, but counteroffensive, which Ukraine has launched in a limited way in the south. Uh, second, whether Russia's, Putin decides to do something more significant um, in terms of um, replenishing Russia's manpower, the only option there is full mobilization which he didn't call for because it actually gets him in a very dangerous situation domestically. You know, a couple other dynamics that include uh, will to fight on both side, sides. And uh, fourth, actually, is the information space. And that, that is an interesting domain that kind of touches on both technology and how we think about uh, information in this world because actors are, including Russia, gaining massive capabilities to manipulate 
the perceptions and not just through you know Twitter trolls or the tactical stuff, but like at much higher scale. So watching if Russia is able to break Western kind of unity of attention on this crisis, which is what it's trying to do now, um, is another key variable to watch. Fantastic. Well, I think we end where we began on, on Russia, Ukraine. So thank you very much to the panel for joining us. And thank you again, Marco, for joining at late notice. And um, yeah, thank you.